11, 1972. The puck was dropped on a new pro hockey league. It was a wild time where strange was good and different was better. In October of 1972, the unlikely alliance of two sports promoters from Southern California and two major junior operators from Western Canada succeeded in starting the World Hockey Association, a league that lasted only seven years, but changed the face of hockey for all time. October 1972 will go down in the annals of sports history as the year when a modern-day miracle occurred. Twelve brand-new, fully manned, well-balanced Canadian and American hockey teams took to the ice and began thawing out the first ice age. The impenetrable fortress that had withstood years of onslaught had finally met its match. was the dawn of a new era brought about by a group of modern-day visionaries who saw a vital need and dedicated themselves to filling it. They did it with top-draw athletes, playing the kind of hockey that's exciting and vibrant. And in the years ahead, they will introduce hockey to hundreds of thousands of fans who otherwise would never have had the opportunity to see a live professional hockey game. The WHA was the brainchild of Dennis Murphy and Gary Davidson, two sports promoters from Orange County who were instrumental in starting up the American Basketball Association. The pair used a similar model for the WHA. But Davidson and Murphy didn't know a thing about hockey. Fortunately, the pair knew enough to enlist Bill Hunter in their cause. Those three men, along with Winnipeg's Ben Hatskin and lawyer Don Regan, were the WHA's founding fathers. Well, Bill Hunter, uh, I've been privileged to know him for 35 years of my life. He, he came when I was in junior uh, with the Oil Kings, my last year of the Oil Kings. And, and then everybody thought, what, a, what kind of a dream is this when he, he started the the, the WHA, he and the group out of California, uh, everybody kind of scoffed at the idea, and then five months later, I'm involved in it, and I'm going, wow, how did that happen? Bill is, is somebody that uh, I have the greatest admiration for. Uh, we wouldn't have hockey here if it hadn't have been for his dream and his actions to get it going. As the thing grew, uh, Bill, Bill's involvement uh, was only for the first six years of it, but uh, it's a lasting legacy that will will be here forever, and uh, he was the founder. He phoned me up one day. I was, I was in the process of, uh, I, I, I wasn't doing anything, suing the Canucks for a breach of contact. <laughs> You know, and uh, was Lucy said, pull me up, he said, how'd you like to get back into hockey and have some fun? We're going to have a team in the World Hockey Association. I said, oh, I've heard that you idiots are trying to fight the NFL or the NHL. I'd love to get into an argument with those smart asses. The concept was a real good concept because hockey was so popular, uh, they weren't expanding, the NHL wasn't expanding, they had the market cornered, it, it was a gravy train for them. And so the WHA, the timing was there. There was lots of players available and not enough teams. When the WHA began operations, there were 16 teams in the NHL, three being in Canada and only two in the American Sun Belt. Murphy, Davidson, and Hunter began to target those markets for their new league. The new league was all over the map, 
literally and figuratively. They issued franchises in such exotic locales as Miami, San Francisco, and of course, Dayton. All would die before the puck was dropped for the first game. Coming up, the league forges ahead. Well, obviously, the, the WHA had, had to do some things to, uh, to make it attractive. Welcome to Hockey Night. Oh, it's a party, all right. Yes, you too. Okay, so beautiful. Stumble shot, Dana. Oh, yeah, people love to party. There was no shortage of parties looking for an interest in a professional sports team. Murphy had a line he loved to use. Would you rather sell brassiers in Muskegon or own a hockey team in Detroit? And a lot of men with money wanted to own a hockey team. Franchises would come and go, seemingly in the middle of the night. The Dayton Arrows became the Houston Arrows. The Miami Screaming Eagles became the Philadelphia Blazers. The San Francisco franchise moved to Quebec, where they became the Nordiques. There were teams in Edmonton, Ottawa, Winnipeg, and even Cleveland. I guess this is the thing that, uh, that really got the WHA going is when Cleveland and Cincinnati were not awarded franchises in the National League in 1972. And uh, when they decided to join the WHA, it sort of gave them the credibility that they needed because now they had uh, some top American cities and, 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 and people um, and not just a sort of a Canadian, Western Canadian league. So uh, um, out of that, of course, uh, followed in hockey, the, uh, the reserve clause uh, was eliminated in, in, in hockey. It was the first sport, I believe, it was eliminated. And that technically, all the players uh, be became uh, free agents. We spent a lot of time looking at American college kids before the NHL really got as active in scouting and assigning those kind of players. We looked for players that were uh, on teams that were good, but because the team was very good, they had to stay in the minor leagues. So we ended up getting, you know, uh, maybe the two or three of the top prospects that weren't quite good enough to play in the NHL, but uh, were good enough to play in the WHA. And then we stole by signing players whose contracts were up and offering them more money than the NHL would, uh, some of the quality players. Well, I was uh, playing with the New York Rangers, and um, this would have been, uh, I was contacted by Bill Hunter, uh, and I was in my last year in New York. The opportunity was to come and play in the new rink, and uh, also that was the year that uh, Team Canada was going to be formed in the, in the uh, fall. And uh, the opportunity, I think, to move my family back, to, uh, and my wife Audrey and Brad, to come back to school in Edmonton, that opportunity was there. And I think putting them all together, even though I, I loved, uh, when I was in New York, I loved uh, the team, and we had a you know, pretty good hockey club. Uh, it was kind of a decision that was made, uh, I think, in the interest of maybe just coming back here and settling back into Edmonton. Well, obviously, uh, the WHA had, had to do some things to, uh, to make it attractive. And uh, as a lawyer, uh, you like the fact that uh, the, the, the NHL contract that uh, really ran in perpetuity in those days, in other words, there was an option that was always renewable by the club so that the player could never get free. And uh, the fact that uh, the WHA came along and challenged that, there's no question that was a major step forward for, for players. And, uh, and hockey, I think. In February of 72, Hunter organized the largest player draft in sports history. Over the two days, just over 1,000 amateur, professional, and retired players were drafted by the WHA's 12 franchises. Russian and Czech players were drafted. With the average NHL salary sitting at around $40,000, the new league then succeeded in signing a few legitimate stars, along with some aging veterans and a huge collection of journeymen. But the league lacked star power, 
a face it could market itself around. They would get that player, and that player gave the WHA its league. Early on in the process, the WHA realized it needed a superstar to legitimize itself. They identified Chicago's Bobby Hull as the man for the job. Hull was then 33 years old and starting on the back nine of his career. But he was still a perennial all-star and one of the three or four best players in the game. Ben Hatskin, owner of the Winnipeg franchise, met with Hull and Hull told his agent to ask for a $1 million signing bonus, mostly to scare away the upstarts. But the new league passed the hat around literally, came up with the money, and eventually signed Hull to a 10-year deal worth $2.75 million. At the time, the richest contract in pro sports history. Coming up, the Golden Jet departs for Winnipeg. I gave him my word, and you must know, and everybody else must know, when I gave my word, it happened. We're in the third period now. Bobby Hull races down the ice. He's cutting around Trombley, getting right in front of him. He scores! And it's Chicago 2, Montreal 1. Living in Winnipeg, there, 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 there was a drumbeat about the fact that uh, Ben Hatskin in particular had been uh, canvassing the, the other clubs in the league about the possibility of pooling their money to sign a big name player. And there was also uh, apparent that uh, Bobby Hull was having contract difficulties with the Chicago Blackhawks. So that, uh, uh, that was an exciting news story as a possibility for, for quite a while. And then when it crystallized, it was a very big deal in our town. I did not want to leave Chicago, the greatest city in the world. And when I, I gave him my word, and you must know, and everybody else must know, when I gave my word, it happened. There was no, there was no contract. There was, it was, it was a, it was a, a phone call to Harvey Weinberg to me. What will it take, Bobby, to get you to Winnipeg? A million bucks, because I thought. I was 32 years old then and felt that I could play for five more years and all I wanted from the Blackhawks was $250,000 a year. Not all I wanted. I thought that was very, very, if they had ever given it to me, uh, generous of them. My dad says, you're not going to like it. You're not going to like Winnipeg. They're going to put a lot of pressure on you and it's not going to be the same as he'd, uh, playing in Chicago. And I said, Dad, what the heck? I'm able, and it's, it's not going to bother me. Well, it, it, I found out it did bother me a little bit, and, and uh, uh, it was quite a cultural shock going from Chicago to Winnipeg. And, uh, but I, may, I had made a decision, and I wasn't going to back out on it. Hull would have to win his freedom in court. The American judicial system would essentially repeal the reserve clause, which chained players to their teams throughout their careers. Others would follow Hull to the new league, and the NHL, which had been dismissive of the WHA, found itself in a war. That was the tip of the iceberg for players with some stature to, uh, to jump from the NHL to the WHA. And, Bernie Perrant and Dave Keon and Ricky Lee and Brad Selwood and that's the, are just guys who played for me that left the NHL when they couldn't get the deal they wanted with the NHL team and went to, to a various number of WHA teams and so <clears throat> the league was taken very serious by the teams in it but I think the NHL on a, as a whole thought yeah yeah this is just an upstart league they don't have a chance financially they won't get as good enough players to compete especially in markets that were close to each other, like Toronto or Minnesota, that had NHL and WHA teams. And uh, I, think that, uh, I think that gave the WHA the, the chance to start. And once they started, in some cities, it was highly successful. Everything changed at that point. We found ourselves in a situation that uh, we lost control over players that we once had control over. 
uh, we got into uh, bidding situations that most teams couldn't afford. And once that was resolved, we found ourselves in a situation, evolving situation, that when you went to acquire a player, the first thing you had to find out was how much, how much money he made. That was never the case in the early years. You, you were trying to assess what he would bring to your team as a player. You know, was he an offensive defenseman? Did he bring grit? Did he, was he, you know, could he score goals? And they were the, they were the most important criteria in, in, in acquiring a player, either through a trade or whatever. Uh, it evolved into the fact that they fell far behind how much money did he make as being the most important factor. Uh, for any team that ran their organization uh, like a business. So that was the evolution of uh, uh, managing an NHL team. I think it went from the assessment of what type of player he was to how much money he made. <laughs> Coming up, more NHL stars jump ship. I said, you know, where are we at? They offered me a $5,000 raise. And I almost cried, right? I says, no. I said, I'm going to see you in a week. And it better be better than that. I think the NHL was so arrogant that they thought you would play for uh, less than half and just so you would have that NHL label. Even if you weren't playing in the NHL, oh, well, I'm with an NHL team. Even if you're playing in the minors, I think they were so arrogant that they thought, okay, even after Bobby had signed with Winnipeg, they still thought that, well, young players, no, no, the, the dream is to play in the NHL. And they, growing up, that was my dream. There was no WHA. My dream was to play in the NHL. And, uh, but the WHA came along, and they had good players. The period ends. The score is still Cleveland nothing, New England nothing. Soon after the signing of Bobby Ho, other stars followed suit. I had this friend, uh, he called me in Montreal. He said, Jerry, so I got a call from, from the person. Um, the, the guy's name was, was Steve Arnold, as a matter of fact. He was collecting players through WJ. And he said, uh, because the Whalers, the New England Whalers, or, or, or the Boston Whalers, or New England Whalers at the time, they had my rights. They drafted me. And they weren't going to mess around with any ruined players as a, as a diplomacy procedure. So they traded my rights to uh, Cleveland. And he said, Cleveland would like to talk to you, right? And I, and I don't mind talking about figures. Uh, I was making 50000 at the time coming off of second Stanley Cup. Uh, I only lost four games that whole year. Uh, and I said, well, you know what? Get some flights. We'll go visit them in Cleveland. We'll have some fun. I've never been to Cleveland before, and I didn't know if you could have fun in Cleveland. Uh, uh, so we went on a, on a Friday. We met a, a wonderful man, Nick Maletti, who owned the team, right? And uh, we got on the plane, had a couple of Buddy Marys, my friend and I, Larry Gordon, who now owns a hockey team in Cleveland. And uh, I said, Larry, this is what we're asking for. We're not budging. Who cares, right? We'll have a nice time. So we go there, and we ask for an outrageous salary. I asked for a million dollars for four years, right? At that time was, you know, I mean, wow. And uh, so we sit down, and after a couple more Bloody Marys, he says, well, Jerry, what's the tariff? Now, Larry, my friend Larry Gordon, was supposed to talk for me, but I jumped right in. I says, Nick, I want a million dollars for four years. He's OK, you got a deal, right? And I went, now, I know at this time, as soon as he said that, that, that I made 50000 for the Bruins, and I was going to have a tough time making seventy or sixty coming off a second Stanley Cup. And, you know, you know they got guys i got to worry about before me, you know, with Bobby and Phil and these guys, and Chief and all these guys. So I didn't know where I stood there, right? I says, hold it there. I said, this is a little, little. He says, well, we'll be in that ballpark. And so I go back. I never told them I was talking to Nick Maletti. And, and uh, um, I said, you know, I, where are we at? They offered me a $5,000 raise. And I almost cried, right? I says, no. I said, I'm going to see you in a week. And, and it better be better than that. And I was looking for somewhere in the neighborhood of, of three years around 250, which is a, any, any, any way you can make 250 in three years, right? Which was probably like one year in Cleveland. But I didn't know anything about the security, the money in Cleveland, whatever. And it never materialized in Boston. And I, and, I, and I finally put a deadline on it without even talking to Cleveland. And they said no. And the only guy that really understood was a coach at the time, Tom Johnson. Uh, Tom and I were sort of friends uh, off 
away from hockey through horse racing and that. And we met a couple times. He says, Jerry, he says, I'm here to, to uh, match the offer that Cleveland's making you. At this is the 11th hour uh, thing. And I says, well, Tommy, this is what they're giving me. He went, holy smokes. He said, they need a coach? And I says, I, I don't think they're going to pay that for a coach. But he says, well, good luck. He understood. I was, had been drafted by the Kings uh, after my second year at college. And I was a late draft, and I, I, I stayed in school for my junior year, my senior year. When I graduated, I went down to Fort Worth, which was the farm team of the Kings at the time. And uh, I played about eight games down there, and I was hoping to get a, to get a contract. And the Kings um, just said, well, we like you. We think you've got a good chance of making our team, but uh, we'd like you to come to training camp. We're not going to offer you a contract. So. Uh, on, on the other side of the ledger, I had been drafted by Houston in the World Hockey Association. So my rights were traded to Cincinnati, and I received a, a one-year contract offer from Cincinnati for, for $25,000. And that, that forced the Kings then to offer me a contract. So I ended up going to training camp my first year with a contract. It was, it was a, a two-way deal, and it, it wasn't big money, but it at least guaranteed I was going to get a great opportunity to make the team. in a row and Davidson came up with a big save to keep I was out. being drafted in 73 and that's when uh, players were getting drafted by both leagues and I didn't uh, for whatever reason it must be because my agent must have had a deal put in place for me to sign in St. Louis I don't know but uh, but there was a lot of players and there was a big splash I remember the Derek Sanderson thing uh, uh, the amount of money that he was being made uh, being paid to uh, to go into I think it was Philadelphia if I remember correctly and that was a huge story in Sports Illustrated. Of course, Bobby Hull and, uh, and Gordie Howe, those were great stories. That league was tough, too, by the way. They had most of the tough guys. Coming up, Clash of the Titans. I can't understand that, uh, why the National League has to be so petty over this. I'm, uh, I'm a Canadian, and uh, I think that I should be able to represent my country, and I want to. The NHL fired the first shots of the war with the WHA when, through Hockey Canada, they barred Hull, Jerry Cheevers, Derek Sanderson, and Bernie Perrant from playing in the 72 Summit Series. I can't, I can't understand that, uh, why the National League has to be so petty over this. I'm, uh, I'm a Canadian, and uh, I think that I should be able to represent my country, and I want to. biggest disappointment in my life. I knew that my dad and I had spoken and uh, and we decided that if the Soviet Union at that time uh, was going to challenge the greatest of supposedly the greatest players in the world of the National Hockey League that they had a good chance of winning or tying. And uh, that first game in Montreal I'm at a house party with Izzy Asper and uh, a number of several dozens of, of prominent Winnipeg people. And of course, it was two to nothing Canada immediately. Early on. And, and they were cheering and cheering and, and they panned the two teams. And the Canadian team guys were the NHL guys, they were sweating bullets. And Harlamov, Petrov, Mihailov, Vasiliev, Gusev, they hadn't even broken a sweat yet. So I said to the people, I said, folks, don't get too excited. By the middle of the second period, things will be a little different. Ah, oh, you're just saying that, it's sour grapes. I said, maybe. By the middle of the second period, <laughs> we, knew, we knew what had happened. Soviets were, were ahead by a good a good number of goals and and it all turned out great though 
turned out to be the greatest series in hockey history, and, and I'm glad that the guys, uh, for the guys that were part of it, and uh, as much as I wasn't, uh, it was still Canada's team, and they did a great job. Well, I, I think I can see where the NHL, you know, drew the line. I mean, I think that they made it an NHL team type of thing, and uh, that excluded some players. So I think that's fair. I mean, when it comes right down to it, uh, they, you know, they made, you know, they made their own decision to move to the WHA, and uh, so you know, I, I don't, I don't feel, you know, that they should have probably been in that series. But the opportunity came, you know, a couple of years later, and. Uh, uh, you know, and Bobby had a chance to, you know, to play and, and play well and played very well in that the 74 series. He was a, I, I think over the whole series was one of our, you know, better players for sure. I thought it was a weak decision not to allow us to play. It was, uh, I, don't, I don't know why. And, you know, Harry, uh, Harry Sinden was a coach who, who, who I would not work for and I've always been with him, and, you know, most, most of the time with him. And when he picked his team, he said to me, and Harry knew more than anyone, he knew what type of a series it was going to be. And he said to me, I'll never forget when he asked me to play, he said, Jerry, I, he says, I don't know how many, because he knows I'm a terrible practice goaltender. He says, all I want you to do is get ready for the first game. You're playing the first game, because I know what type of a game that's going to be. He says, I'd like to have you in there. And I said, geez, well, that's, that's an honor. And then I, I my, myself, Dryden, and I think Tony O was the, the three goalies. And I knew like a month or six weeks before that I was going to play the first game. And I didn't know the importance of it. I really didn't. Uh, only one guy did, I think, was Harry, Harry and maybe John Ferguson, knew what we were in for. I mean, of all series, that's probably one of the, I mean, how can you argue, it's one of the great series of all times. And he knew it. I got a spear, cross-check, and a slap in the face, and with a second. <laughs> While that was going on, I maybe got dis bitter, disappointed that I wasn't involved in this. Maybe I would have been pulled in the first period, uh, because Kenny Dryden, but, but you can ask Kenny Dryden. It's not an easy team to play against uh, for a goaltender. Coming up, the puck is dropped on the Upstart Hockey League. Well, we seem to have a lot of fun. Uh, the guys didn't take themselves too seriously most of the time. Here's a special free offer. The WHA opened play on October 11, 1972, with the Ottawa Nationals hosting the Alberta Oilers in a game that was televised across Canada. The league consisted of two divisions of six teams each. And while the hockey wasn't always an artistic success, the WHA began to establish itself. Well, we seemed to have a lot of fun. Uh, the guys didn't take themselves too seriously most of the time. And uh, I mean, you had to laugh at some of the things uh, you didn't know. For a lot of the players, they didn't know if the team was going to last the year or the week or the day. And, and so some of those things uh, had obviously had an effect. We, our travel was substantially different than in the NHL. We, uh, we had one, uh, one year we got a plane that uh, we could have gone to Europe quicker than it took us to go to Quebec. It was a two-engine prop job. I mean, I think we changed, refueled about eight times on the way across Canada. So those are are things that were obviously a big difference. Uh, but as the league grew and, and got uh, better and better quality players and, and they thinned the thing out into the right, the right teams, uh, the hockey became very good. And then uh, with the European influence, it, it uh, really took off. And at the end, uh, we could compete with a lot of NHL teams. A lot of people didn't believe in the league. I was there in 72, we were there for seven years. We brought some great players over. We always have to remember and thank Bobby Hall for coming over, and certainly then Nurse Pat Stapleton. Then came along the young guys, Gretzky, Messier, Michel Goulet, Rick Vive. And they came along, gave us a big boost to be able to, and I'm forgetting some guys. There were some great players who came along, and uh, I became coach in Indianapolis, head coach. I started with the Chicago Cougars, and I was very fortunate. I had Coach Junior at Montreal. Uh, it was a tough road because my English was not very good. Uh, no name, no, never played pro, and uh, the players stuck with me, and I am glad because uh, they're the one who made my career, and that's where I started my career. The league plowed ahead, sort of. 
Opening night in Philadelphia had to be postponed because the Zamboni crashed through the ice. Derek Sanderson came out to make the announcement to the crowd and was pelted with souvenir pucks which had been passed out. New England would beat Winnipeg to win the first Avco Cup, but it also became clear there were trouble spots in the WHA. Sanderson played just eight games with the Blazers, injured himself, and was bought out of his $2.3 million contract as the Blazers moved to Vancouver. The Ottawa Nationals finished the year playing in Toronto, where John Bassett took over the team. The New York Raiders were forced out of Madison Square Garden and moved to New Jersey, where they became the Knights. But there were successes as well. In the second year, the Houston Arrows coaxed Detroit Red Wings legend Gordie Howe out of retirement. The game's grand old man would play with his sons Mark and Marty and lead the Arrows to back-to-back -back WHA championships. Gordie Howe's run in the WHA continued with the Arrows until 1977, and then with the New England Whalers under the coaching influence of Harry Neal. To get a chance to coach Gordie Howe, first of all, when we signed him in the summer, I thought, don't tell me I'm going to, now this is the year he's going to turn 50. Don't tell me I'm going to be the coach that has to tell him he can't do it anymore. And thought, you know, of all the people that nobody wants to do it, especially me. And he was my idol growing up uh, as a kid. I remember one day I told him when I got to know him a little better, I said, Gordy, you don't know how many times I was you in my driveway playing tennis ball hockey with a tennis ball. And he looked up from reading the paper and said, did I ever score? He was brilliant. He was, uh, he loved the game. I, I, I think the difference between the greats and the real good ones is not their talent, it's their passion for the game. Eddie Green out of the Jets and Claude St. Sauvay out of the Everton Oilers. Newberg across the blue line, Nelson. In the league's fourth year, the Jets brought over Anders Hedberg, Ulf Nielsen, and Lars Erik Schoberg from Sweden. And with Hull, they would form the nucleus of the best ever WHA teams. This was a time when Europeans were regarded with suspicion, if not contempt, by the hockey establishment. But Hull, Hedberg, and Nielsen would form one of the greatest lines in the game's history. The WHA was uh, the uh, forerunners in bringing over Europeans. They would, uh, I remember Sonmore telling me, we don't care where they're from, if they can play in the league, we're gonna go after them. So we had a lot more Europeans in the WHA than the NHL did until the merger. And that was another lesson maybe the NHL learned from the WHA, that these, some of these guys are good enough to play in the best league in the, in the world. And for the Europeans, I know the WHA had more of them, and not necessarily the first ones, but they had more of them. And uh, when you look at the number of Europeans who started in the WHA, who went to the NHL, some of them had real good careers. The Jets had in the very, in the 74, 75 season, they had six Europeans on their team. They had four Swedes, which were Ulf Anderson and, and Lars Eric Schoberg, and had a backup goalie, Kurt Larson. And two Finnish players, Veli Pekka, Ketola, Ketola, we would say over here, but and uh, Hexi Riavanta. And the team missed the playoffs that year. And at the end of the year, when they were doing their review, uh, I remember Dr. Wilson was involved in the review, even though he was the team doctor. There was a feeling amongst some in the management that uh, one of the problems with the team is there were too many Europeans on the team that didn't coalesce as a team. It wasn't tough enough. And uh, yet, when they'd done an individual assessment of each player, the Europeans had uh, all gained ratings of either either fine to, to excellent. And uh, Jerry, in particular, said this was not making sense to him that that we should be as, uh, looking at the, missing the playoffs and blaming it on the six Europeans who got reasonably good re assessments. The following year, they, they went to 10 Europeans. They went, uh, and in the succeeding uh, four years, uh, they won the uh, WHA championship three times and lost it in the seventh game the other time. And I think that was a major breakthrough for European players in, in North America. They were the first to really understand that Europeans had something to offer. And so that you had the Winnipeg Jets putting together Ulf Nielsen and Anders Hedberg with Bobby Hull to produce what probably was the best line in hockey in those years, although no one recognized it or no one would admit to it. And uh, the style of hockey started to change then. And after you had uh, uh, 
the WHA embracing Europeans a little more than the NHL did. The NHL was still thinking that Borja Salmin was more of a North American style player, whereas the WHA was playing a wide open, let's see what we can do. Let's, let, let's bring some creative geniuses here, such as eventually Kent Nielsen showed up, who, who uh, Gretzky would say, if you, you asked him, was probably the greatest talent he ever saw on the ice. And uh, the, the game changed much, I think, for the better with the European influence, and so I do give the WHA credit for that. We were able to bring in, you know, some really good European players that nobody, uh, you know, had, had done previous, uh, you know, to that extent. And as I mentioned, you know, we had, you know, uh, Risto Silton and, and uh, you know, and Curry, and, and, and that was all through uh, Barry Fraser, who had done a lot of scouting in Europe. And he was a, he, he uh, I think, in a lot of ways changed the, uh, that part of the hockey itself. Uh, it made everybody else aware of uh, they better, you know, have play, have scouts in Europe as well, and and get over there and start following, you know, some of their, uh, you know, their hockey uh, more than what they'd ever done before. Coming up, the end is near. I think at any time, whatever business you're in, when you've been at war and you see peace at hand, you've got to feel gratified. When it comes to going bald... By years five and six, the WHA actually enjoyed a period of success and stability. The league also became known for its physical play. They had good cities, and adding them to our league, I felt, would give us a, a stronger league, would give us more cities, would help us in our national television ratings. And at the same time, if they paid us four million a franchise, they had, I think, 12 at the time, and we had talked about taking an 11, they would eliminate whichever one we wanted. Uh, that would have been, you know, what, $44 million? divided up in our league, and, and in that day, that was a lot of money. But after the 76-77 season, the NHL, led by the anti-merger faction in Toronto and Boston, rejected a peace plan with the new league. Four franchises would fold after that year, leaving the league with eight teams the next year and seven in 78-79, its last season. Still, the WHA didn't go down without a fight. The WHA was smart enough to say, OK, uh, we'll sign these 18-year-old kids. And that, I think, uh, helped uh, precipitate the merger, or whatever you want to call it, between the WHA and the NHL. They were still going after great underage players, Wayne Gretzky being one. The Cincinnati Stingers signed Mike Gartner, and a young winger from Edmonton named Mark Messier. The Birmingham Bulls signed six more junior stars, including Rob Ramage, Michel Goulet, Rick Vive, Craig Hartsburg, Gaston Gingra, and goalie Pat Riggin. Collectively, they became known as the Baby Bulls. All right, we're all ready for the face-off. Terry Ruskowski, after missing the last game, is back in the Jets lineup tonight. And we're just awaiting the return of Ron Chipperfield from the Oilers bench. 
Five goals to set a WHA record in Friday's game. Did he save any for tonight? He says he'd like to get a hat trick. Well, who wouldn't? And now we will have a change in the faceoff man for Winnipeg. Lukowicz taking the draw against Chipperfield, replacing Roskowski, and now they're sending Lukowicz out. Finally, it's Lindstrom who takes the draw, and the puck comes to Schmier. Schmier crosses center, fires it in. Smith sets it up in behind. But the 78-79 season also represented the WHA's last gasp. It was a board decision and was made uh, late uh, yesterday, and uh, we regret very, very much to have to arrive at such a decision, but it's a decision of the board. I think at any time, whatever business you're in, when you've been at war and you see peace at hand, you've got to feel gratified. I, my personal feeling is that I'm looking forward to seeing this tremendous effort that we've, both leagues, have put in fighting each other. And that's effort by people, by time, and by money, and other resources. That those efforts and those resources channeled into the development of this sport. The two leagues agreed to a merger deal following that season, allowing New England, Winnipeg, Edmonton, and Quebec into the NHL. The NHL also pillaged the Rebel League of its best players, but they left Gretzky in Edmonton. And five years later, the Great One would be skating around Northlands, carrying the Stanley Cup. How would you like as a Canadian to be uh, in the, an NHL fan and not have Edmonton and Calgary in it? It's too bad what happened to Winnipeg and Quebec, because that was terrific for across Canada to have uh, uh, six teams in the league. Uh, now, it all didn't work out, obviously, but uh, when you look at the teams that came in on the merger, from a Canadian viewpoint, uh, Edmonton won, what, five Stanley Cups? And uh, so for the Canadian hockey fans, it was one of the great things that ever happened. Well, yeah, I think there are a lot of guys that uh, had an opportunity to play at a very high level that maybe wouldn't have gotten that opportunity had the WHA not come along. You know, there are guys that uh, had been liberated from the minors, so to speak. So they, uh, it was a great opportunity for them but they were having a heck of a lot of fun also. They brought a, uh, I guess that camaraderie of, of a minor league team, the ride in the buses and everything else, uh, the thrill of finally getting to a big league. So it was an interesting cast of characters. I, I think it was more a sense of relief for the teams that were in the NHL that finally stability could, th there was some good players starting to leave the NHL teams. It was gonna be a, it was gonna be an ongoing problem if they would have continued to, to be able to support that league. They were taking young players away from junior teams. So I, I think it was more a sense that, you know, common sense means there should be one league. These teams, I, I don't think teams thought they were going to be. I did see some WHA games uh, when the league was operating, and I saw some great games in that league. And most of the NHL people didn't want to say that this league was really for for real and it was there was some because they went out and got players that NHL couldn't get some younger players but it was more a sense of relief when they both amalgamated the two leagues and and uh, I don't think though the teams thought these teams were going to be as strong Quebec had a strong team and they they didn't take long Quebec never won the cup with the uh, Nordics but they were strong teams they had good playoff runs I think I'm a classic example of a guy who got a chance to coach uh, pro hockey, maybe not quite as good as the NHL, but we were better than the NHL thought we were and probably not as good as we thought we were. And, uh, and when you talk about trainers or equipment men or scouts or coaches or players, a number of people got started in pro hockey in the WHA and ended up in the NHL either before the merger or after. I thought it was a great expansion idea. Got shot down. So it took many more years of war and pain and losing players and raising salaries and raising ticket prices and all those things that happened before it finally happened. And then we took in, I think, four teams, was it, or something like that? A lasting legacy. There are two sides to the WHA story. The first concerns the folding franchises, the bouncing checks, the slapstick hockey, and the collection of characters the league produced in its short, unruly seven years.
When hockey men meet, they invariably talk about Bill Goldthorpe or the Birmingham Bulls or any of the crazy stories the WHA produced. But there's another part to the WHA's legacy. The league shattered the NHL's monopoly and gave players freedom and their first chance at a decent payday. And I will say this, the WHA should be thanked by every player in hockey because it was the first time there was any gigantic salary increase in the NHL. You got twice the money to leave or you got twice the money not to and that ha ended up costing the NHL a lot of money and we all know where they are now with that. It brought hockey to markets in Canada that couldn't have dreamed of an NHL team. Its best teams brought over Europeans and demonstrated you could have success in North America with a game built on speed and skill when the game was being overrun by goons. Pro hockey wouldn't be where it is today without the WHA. October 11th, 1972. A day that changed the game. Here come the players. Happy. Experience magical moments in franchise history with the Calgary Flames 10 Great Playoff Games box set. Available now wherever DVDs are sold and at shop.nhl.com. Just two games, but it's never quiet with Sean Avery making his season debut for the Rangers as they host Timu Solani and the Surging Ducks. On the West Coast, the Vancouver Canucks welcome Brendan Morrow and his Dallas Stars to Van City. NHL on the fly starts now.